Bonjour, chers collègues, professeurs, étudiants. Bienvenue à notre collègue aujourd'hui. C'est la lecture de Gadamer avec Jean-Luc Marion. I'm very pleased to introduce our Gadamer professor for 2023, Jean-Luc Marion, a member of the Académie Française, one of les immortels, as they call them. He's also, en passant, Chevalier de la Légion d'Honneur, Officier des de Palmes Académiques, Commander des Lords de Saint Grégoire le Grand, uh, among other titles. <clears throat> I'll say a, first, a few words about the Gadamer Professorship itself. The Gadamer Chair honors Hans Georg Gadamer, born 1900 and died 2002, the distinguished German philosopher and practitioner of hermeneutics and student of Heidegger and others, who was professor at Frankfurt and Heidelberg, and who came here to Boston College after his retirement in 1974 and taught here annually until 1980 on the invitation of Professor Fred Lawrence, who's in the front row here today. Boston College has hosted a number of outstanding European scholars over the years, including Jacques Tamignot, uh, Richard Carney, who is now a colleague, Rudolf Burnett, Axel Honneth, Jean Greisch, and then after the title became the official Gardner Professorship, we had Gunter Figal, Geoffrey Barash, Françoise Dastour, Rémi Braque, Alessandro Ferrara, Dan Zahavi, Emmanuel Falk, Point Moyer, Marcia Cavalcante Schubach, and Claude Romano in 2020. We were then disrupted by the pandemic, so I'm most happy that we are able to be back in person today with our uh, speaker, Jean-Luc Marion. So now I would like to say a few words about Professor Marion. He was born in Moudon, a suburb of Paris, and studied first at the Lycée Condorcet, and then at the École Normale Supérieure, where he completed his aggregation, and then his doctorat de troisième siècle, siècle avec, uh, <coughs> but with uh, Ferdinand Alquier at the University of Paris Cat. He, his, his dissertation uh, was on the, the Regulé of Descartes. He then completed his second doctorate, the Doctorat d'État, uh, also on Descartes at the Sorbonne in 1980. He moved then to Poitiers. Uh, from 1981 to 1988, Paris 10, Nanterre from 1988 to 1995, and then the Sorbonne until his retirement in 2011. He has also been a professor at the Institut Catholique, and he is, well, he is currently emeritus professor from the Sorbonne. He has been the holder of many distinguished chairs, including the <coughs> Cher Cardinal Mercier of the Catholic University of Leuven, the Lacheur de Métaphysique, Etienne Gilson of the Institut Catholique, and visiting professor at La Sapienza University in Rome. He has delivered the Gifford Lectures at the University of Glasgow in 2014, and for many years, following Paul Ricoeur, he has been a visiting professor <coughs> at the University of Chicago, uh, where he was Andrew Thomas Greedy and Grace McNichols Greedy Professor of Catholic Studies, a professor of, the, of philosophy of religions and theology. He won the Prix Charles Lambert for his uh, L'Idole et la Distance in 1978. Jean-Luc Marion has a justified international reputation as a formidable Descartes scholar, as a phenomenologist of the theological turn, and as a Catholic theologian and apologist. His first book in 1975 was L'Ontologie Grise de Descartes, where the grey ontology refers to Descartes' use of scholasticism lying beneath the self-certain science of the Regulé. His many publications on Descartes subsequently included The Metaphysical Prism of Descartes, The Constitution and Limits of Ontotheology and Cartesian Thought, and other Questions Cartesiennes, and many other books. But he has also a second stream of interest, in, namely the phenomenological critique of metaphysics, about which we will probably hear more tonight. 
And here the guiding figures for Marion are Augustine, Descartes, Husserl, and Heidegger. Marion belongs to, or has been described to, what is called the theological turn in French phenomenology, le tournant uh, théologique, which includes people like Jean-François Courtin, Jean-Louis Chrétien, Michel Henri, uh, Nathalie Dupraz, and others. He has maintained that the original claim of phenomenology to, to, to givenness, donation, to given it in German, uh, has neglected or ignored forms of givenness that exceed objectivity. And he has been famous for his introduction of the notion of the saturated phenomenon. He is also interested in the old metaphysical theme of God without being, or the theme of negative theology, which he has written about in books including Dieu sans lettre, or text, uh, translated as God without being, uh, and also in other uh, recent books. But a groundbreaking book for us uh, was L'Idole et la Distance, published in 1977, The Idol and the Distance, which has only recently appeared in translation, and in which Marion carried out a critique of ontotheology. Indeed, I first met Professor Marion through my friend and colleague Richard Carney, who is here tonight, when he and another young Irish graduate student, Joseph O'Leary, Father Joseph O'Leary, organized a colloque Irlande Francais uh, with a groundbreaking seminar on Heidegger et la question de Dieu at the College des Irlandais in Paris in 1979. The proceedings were later published, edited by Richard Carney, uh, but in that book is, uh, along with Ricoeur, Beaufray, Francois Fédier, and others, is uh, the work of Jean-Luc Marion. Most recently, uh, or well, more recently, I should say, Professor Marion has been working on the notions of grace, uh, love, and the meaning of revelation. His major works here include uh, La Le Phénomène, Phénomène Erotique, uh, which he published in 2003, Prologum, Prologum à la Charité, 1986, and then the most recent work, Derrière la Révélation besides the revelation, or on the other hand, the revelation, or something like that. He has been visiting professor at Boston College on two previous occasions, first in 2001, and again in 2003. And indeed, uh, our colleague, who's also here tonight, Jeffrey Rocco, has included Marion in a pop work published in, 19, in 2000, entitled The Face of the Other and the Trace of God, Essays on the Thought of Emmanuel Levinas, who's another figure in this uh, pantheon of uh, uh, phenomenologists involved in the theological turn. Uh, I think I've said enough uh, to introduce who is the, perhaps one of the greatest living figures in French philosophy today. So I'd like to say personally, welcome to you, Professor Marion, and we look forward to hearing your talk tonight. So thank you very much. A central place for, uh, say, real philosophy <laughs> <laughs> and uh, strong and uh, yes, strong and orthodox theology. So it is a place where uh, it is difficult. I cannot not to uh, find myself very uh, pleasant. Uh, I will uh, allow me to say I shall give uh, another lecture in Harvard, I think in May 1st, something like that. In fact, the two lectures are uh, connected. Today, I want to explain how we can understand the meaning of metaphysics. And uh, in Harvard, I shall try to explain how it is perhaps possible to overcome this understanding of metaphysics. So it is a two-fold uh, 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 exposition. And in fact, um, 
the speech says second advice is that the first is very boring. <laughs> <laughs> I have to, to tell you that. Uh, it will be very boring and very long. Uh, <laughs> so the question. My question is this. Uh, there is a lot of discussion today in philosophy about whether you support or you deconstruct the concept of metaphysics. And many philosophers, professional philosophers, are divided about this issue. Uh, indeed, in that discussion, uh, uh, both parts share the same uh, uh, figure. That is, the concept of metaphysics is not clearly uh, defined. And all of them, I myself included, are in the situation of Kant, who said in the, in the, in the first critic of pure reason at the end, <coughs> I translate, uh, we shall always return to metaphysics as to a beloved lady with one we have broken, which is exactly our situation. We love metaphysics, and we are not uh, living with metaphysics. We are broken with metaphysics, and we have a nostalgia. And uh, an, another symptom of this very strange situation can be uh, borrowed from uh, the famous uh, polemic between Carnap and Heidegger. As you know, uh, Heidegger in 1927 uh, gave a very famous lecture, uh, What is Metaphysics? And two, the, the year after, it was published only in 1931, uh, Rudolf Carnap answered with a uh, very famous lecture too, uh, uh, overcoming metaphysics through uh, the uh, logical use of language against uh, Heidegger. And uh, so the simple picture is that on one side there was Heidegger trying to restore uh, metaphysics, and the other side, the father of the uh, logical positivism to come, of Carnap was destroying metaphysics. Not, not, too, too, not too fast. Because, in fact, uh, we know that Heidegger, uh, 15 years later, wrote another essay, Über Windung der Metaphysik. So, he was, he has upset his position about metaphysics. So, there is a, I could explain this in detail, the evolution of Heidegger, First, he tried to restore the, the old ontology with the fundamental ontology, and then to restore metaphysics in a more radical way, by saying that the Taza is itself is metaphysics and so on. But on the other side, <coughs> Carnap, uh, when he came to Chicago to, Chicago to uh, initiate logical positivism as a comprehensive system of philosophy, had some uh, achievement and some followers, and among those followers, we all know uh, George Burkham, who published in uh, 1954 the metaphysic, metaphysics of logical positivism. Here, again, there was a complete reverse of the, the, the initial situation. I could give a lot of other examples of this instability. Uh, of the concept of metaphysics in many uh, situations. Uh, this can be shown even in the, the Catholic tradition among neotomists. Uh, and they disagree about the meaning of metaphysics. Between Gilson and Maritain, between Leuven and Rome, uh, there is more disagreements about metaphysics than any agreement according to the so-called uh, Thomist, Thomistic orthodoxy. So let us start by this symptom, we have no clear understanding of metaphysics. Why? I think that 
you can uh, discuss metaphysics from a purely theoretical and speculative way, the point of view. This is not the right way to uh, have a clear insight on it. Why? Because metaphysics was not the first name of philosophy. There is a, a birth date of metaphysics, and there is perhaps, for the same reason, a death date of metaphysics. And as philosophy was, did not start using the word metaphysics, it can well be uh, foreseen that philosophy may survive the end of metaphysics. So I want to give a sketch today of a possible historical definition of metaphysics. When did metaphysics start? When did and why did metaphysics start? The first uh, paradox is this. We have no real use of the word metaphysics before 14 century, before Dan Scotus, and his questionnaire metaphysicalis at the beginning of 14th century. I shall come back to this point. So before, earlier, we speak of the metaphysics of Aristotle, as all uh, students know, <coughs> every student know. Uh, Aristotle himself has never used the word metaphysics. Uh, I quote here uh, Suarez, uh, the Jesuit 16th century. <coughs> uh, the name of Metaphysica, none was uh, used neither by Aristotle nor by his commentators. It is uh, the Disputationes Metaphysicae, uh, first Disputatio Premium. We know that the name of metaphysics is only a name for classification. This is the uh, librarian interpretation, that is, the, the collection of the essays by Aristotle, <coughs> which were classified after those classified about uh, physics. And this by his uh, first editor, Andronikos of Rhodes, <coughs> who was the first to use the formulation meta ta physica. So there was a great discussion whether it, it was only a classification or perhaps uh, something uh, more uh, uh, conceptual, but uh, the discussion is uh, still running and uh, the majority uh, of, the, of uh, the scholars admit that it is first of all a classification. So, uh, the most uh, obvious understanding of metaphysica is to say what comes after the physics, the consideration of physics. And it is in that uh, way that, for instance, uh, Thomas Aquinas, after Albert the Great, uh, uh, has uh, understood uh, uh, metaphysica as transphysica scientia, the science which is beyond through physics. And this uh, formulation was uh, repeated and kept uh, through the old medieval ages, through uh, up to Suarez, at the end of the second scholasticism, but also by Kant. Kant himself says that, uh, I quote <coughs> here a uh, uh, course uh, of uh, metaphysics collected by Heinze, <coughs> Kant says that, I, I read, uh, for the name of metaphysics, we should not uh, believe that it was uh, uh, chosen by chance. It is fitting exactly the science in question. Therefore, because, however, this physis means nothing but nature, and as we cannot have access to nature, but through experience, the science which come after this first science of nature through experience is called metaphysica 
meta, trans, et physica. It is a science which is beyond or outside the field of physics, and it's why it is metaphysics. So this definition was kept up to count. So let us uh, admit that there is a deep historical in, uh, in this in determination of the concept of metaphysics. So this is a fact of uh, name. Is there a good reason to have this in determination of uh, the uh, lacking metaphysic during from Aristotle up to uh, Thomas Aquinas? No. There are many reasons why uh, during that period it was quite impossible to unify metaphysics in a real concept. The first of those reasons is uh, obvious, it is well known of, by all the readers of Aristotle. We know, and this comes from a discussion initiated by uh, Werner Jaeger at the uh, beginning of the 19th century about the two uh, central gravity points of the so-called metaphysics by Aristotle. That is, there is two sciences there competing, a science of to on et on, ans in quantum ans, being as being, in book gamma, and another science of the first philosophy, which is the divine, and uh, this first philosophy is uh, uh, discussed in book uh, epsilon, in book, uh, in book lambda. And the question, how to uh, unify those two uh, first uh, considerations of philosophy, starting either with a universal science or with a divine science, the science of the divine, is very difficult. All the commentators of Aristotle uh, were divided about that. It is a classical question. And uh, we have a solution. There is a, a formal solution. This uh, the conclusion of uh, chapter one of book Epsilon of the so called metaphysics, where Aristotle says that <coughs> the science of the divine is universal as a science of being quasi because it is the first. Catalou, utos, oti, pote. It is very clear that this means nothing. It is the formulation of the difficulty. It is universal because it is first. Precisely all the, the point to explain how universal, uh, the first science, focusing on the exceptional case of the divine nature, could be uh, 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 the truth of the science of a universal common being. And it is, it is not explained just by a juxtaposition of the universality of the philosophy. So, the first reason is very clear. There is no unity between the two possible uh, primordial sciences in the books of metaphysics. And this is a very uh, crux for all interpretation of Aristotle uh, up to now. And there is no clear uh, solution to that uh, problem. The last who have uh, tried to find a new solution was precisely my friend bring me bring by. But uh, even Rémi is not convinced by his own <laughs> But there is much more important uh, as, uh, I would say, an indetermination in the uh, uh, failure of the so-called metaphysics. It is the fact that uh, this science, whatever it may have been, never included the consideration of God. It is very surprising for us, because for us, spontaneously, metaphysics is the part of philosophy which de deal with God. This was not the case. Uh, uh, I refer, I could refer to Madison, to Nascot, uh, to uh, uh, Albert the Great, but let us uh, focus just on Thomas Aquinas in his commentary on uh, the Trinitate of Boethius in question 5, article, first article answer, when he says that there is two theologies, two theologies, 
the theology of the Sacra Doctrina, Revelation, Bible, where God is included. Because it is the word of God, so God is included, it is all word and revelation. But there is another uh, theology, which is the theology of the philosopher. And strangely enough, this second theology, duplex theologia, the second theology is called metaphysica. But the theology of the philosophers, the Greeks, is, which is based on the question of being, cannot include the question of God, because God is not one among the beings. For Thomas Aquinas, as you know well, God is not one of the beings, not even the first. It is the act of being. So the fact to know a concept of being gives you no access to the essay, the actus essendi. So there is no connection between the actus essendi and the essay. So very clearly, for Thomas Aquinas, the Christian God is not included in the possible object of metaphysics, if any, and if it would be, for instance, the consideration of being by being. So there is many other authors to, to in agreement with the Aquinas and that thing. So strangely enough, uh, there was no God included in metaphysics before precisely the use of metaphysics. And there is a third objection about the insufficiency uh, of the metaphysics, the so-called metaphysics, which is a great objection and more decisive objection raised by Heidegger. To sum it up briefly, it is to say philosophy is supposed to be the science, the knowledge of being. But being, in Greek, to on, is only the participle present of the verb einat. To be. Being is a variation of to be. And you can understand to be a being in two ways. Either as a verb, that is, the process of being. Or you can understand it as a result of the process of being, that is, this or that being. A being, a seeing being. So in that case, it is toon as well. So toon can be understood verbally or as a name, a substantive. What was the choice of Greek, philosoph Greek, Greek philosophy? That is, first of all, Aristotle. It was to say, and we all know that, it is the beginning of the book Gamma, of the so-called metaphysics, that there is a science which tries to study to be to on a on, which is translated being for being. The question for us, uh, is this a verb or a substantive? A thing or the process of being? Answer, it is I follow up the position of the text <coughs> to uh, consider to theorem a science who theorem to on et on, tuto esti, tis et usia. That is to say, what it is, the usia. The usia, we translate that either by essence or substance, is what in the thing remains strongly identical to itself, which is enduring in presence. This is the Usia. The answer of what Aristotle understood to on eon is very clearly this is a noun, a substantive, a substantia, an essentia, an usia. Which means, I think, that here the question of being is completely uh, uh, obscured. The question of being is no more the question of how things come to be, the process of being, the act of being, the verb, but 
is only the consideration of the result of the process. That is, the thing itself. And so Heidegger says, in fact, in philosophy, starting with the Greeks, which are not the solution, but the origin of the difficulty, the, the main aporia is that the question of to be was reduced to the question of what is a being. To be, the verb, was completely put aside because it was much more difficult to think about that, and the attention was focused on what is more easy to understand, that is the result of the process which you keep under your eyes, which is standing usia, the standing substantia. That is, there is no question of to be in the question of being. That is, the, the beings uh, have overruled the question of to be. And so you can say that, starting with Aristotle, the question of being was, was closed, was distorted into the being, the study of the beings, against the consideration of the process to be. For those three reasons, we understand far better why there was an anonymity, anonymity of metaphysics up to, up to Thomas Aquinas. The, the central text for that is uh, <coughs> can be found in the first the prologue of the commentary by Thomas Aquinas of the so-called 12 books of Aristotle metaphysics very famous text. And in this commentary, uh, Thomas makes a distinction between three, uh, how to say that, three uh, uh, possible uh, sciences which can claim to be the first philosophical discipline. And uh, those three sciences, so competing, or, uh, are uh, There is the first philosophy, the, uh, the Metaphysica, and the Scientia Divina. The Scientia Divina is the science of the divine as such, that is the most perfect uh, beings or being. The Metaphysica is the Scientia of being qua being. With those two, we, we see clearly that he is referring to Aristotle. Scientia Divina, it is uh, the, uh, the, uh, the book uh, Lambda, uh, or the book uh, Epsilon of Metaphysics. Scientia Metaphysica, it is the book of uh, book Gamma. And there is the science of the first cause. The science of the first cause, ITI, first book of uh, the metaphysics. And those three possible first are taken together under one common science in, to comment on the books of Aristotle, by, by Aristotle. So we could expect, as a, a, a naive reader, that Thomas would choose a name to unify the three. There is no name. He, did, he says, Aex Scientia. This science, this science can be related to the three I've quoted. And never else, never else, never, there is no other <coughs> text where he says, under which name we can unify the three possible meanings of the first, the first part of philosophy. So, Thomas himself has kept the anonymity of metaphysics. He do, does not even use the word metaphysics, which has a very narrow uh, uh, meaning in this case, that is the science of uh, being, being. 
only one of the, th the three. So the anonymity is, in fact, <coughs> appears when, for the first time, the word metaphysics start to be used. Because after Thomas, it, what it will be used on a regular basis and more and more. And, but for Thomas, we have uh, with the index of uh, the Buza, which is a, a, computer, uh, a computerized index of, uh, uh, of Thomas, we have all the, the, the items of uh, Metaphysica. Most of the time, if not always, uh, it is a nickname for the books of Aristotle. It is not the science. Uh, or something which is a part of the uh, domestic system, if you know. So, how the word metaphysica imposes itself? It is a long story. Story starting with Tanscotus, beginning of 14th century, up to Suarez, the end of 16th century. Franciscan Jesuit. Uh, the main turn, and it is absolutely central in the history of philosophy, was the discovery of the conceptus antis, the concept of being. Previously, there was no concept of being. And it is for us one of the reasons why there was no unification of the so called metaphysics. What does that mean? And why it is so crucial to uh, consider a concept of being. A concept is the act of conceiving by the mind. So, is it possible to conceive being? If it would be poss possible, in that case, we could unified being, uh, uh, although being has m many forms, many, deg many degrees, many specifications in, among all the different kinds of being we experience, would we be able to conceive a concept of being? It would fit all of them like the gap fit all sides. The concept of being would fit all beings. And this was done. There is a first concept, the first thing, which is not the thing, which we can consider. How, how is that possible? That's a paradox. And you, I, I, I spare you all the text by Dan Scotus and mostly by uh, Suarez. If you want, you can just read the three first, among uh, the three first Disputationes Metaphysicae by Suarez and about the Conceptus Santis. The Conceptus Santis has an object. It is something which is represented and uh, grasped by the concept. This object is universal, it is precisely the goal, can be used for in any possible case. But to be universal, it has to be without distinctions. Because if it would be too specialized, too uh, complex, too uh, highly defined, it would not fit every case. So to fit every case, of being, it should be universal, that is abstract. We say even universalissimus, universalissimus, abstractissimus, and in fact empty. Without any content. That is, the content of the concept of being is precisely the fact it has no precise content. This is the condition for its ability to be applied to any case in the experience. So we have a concept, says Scotus, 
we have a concept of being previous to any special knowledge of the kind of being. This concept of being is infinite, and because he has no predetermination, no limitation, it can be used in all cases, including that of God. It's why the first uh, distinction, the first determination, will be to draw a line between the conceptus infinitus and the conceptus finitus. That is, the first distinction is that there is a, an infinite meaning of the, of, the concept, of the concept of being, which is used only in the case of God. But you see, there is the same concept for God and anything else. To the point that uh, Suarez, Suarez, it is uh, uh, three centuries later, will say, frankly, he is a very, he uh, is not always clear. And he's, he's uh, always uh, speaking with uh, tongue in the cheek, uh, not frankly <coughs> to to be in agreement with uh, everyone. But there is a case where he is very bold <laughs> and very honest. That is not always the case, as we uh, uh, because he claimed to be a Thomist. In this, in, he's in fact in, in no way a Thomist. <laughs> uh, but uh, he says that <coughs> I quote. Would we be asked to make a choice between the analogy of being between God and finite beings on one side, and on the other side, the university of the concept of being, we should definitely prefer to keep the university of the concept of being because this university is much more intelligible than the analogianities, which is absolutely true. The question is whether, in the case of God, we should and could expect to have a very easy case of knowledge. What does that mean? That the case of God could be easy to understand. In that case, for us, it, is, it would be. It would not be the case of God anymore. That's why the question is beyond the mind of uh, outside the mind of Suarez. Anyway, so this concept of being, to some extent, includes God because it implies nothing. That's the paradox. And uh, let us uh, pay a bit more attention to this concept of being. Suarez makes a distinction between the concept, the objective concept of being, and the formal concept of being. What does that mean? <coughs> Suarez is a very uh, rational and uh, insightful mind. He admits that this concept of an object which should be universal, abstract, empty, and without a definition, is a bit of a contradiction. It does not stand steadily by itself. And this was, a, in fact, the difficulty of the concept into the concept of scientists by Dan Scotus. So he tried to give the reason why we can admit this very strange content of being answer. What makes the unity of this concept is not the content of the concept, that is, the object of the conceptus objectivus. It is the origin, the act of producing this conception. That is, the act of the mind, the conceptus formalis. And he says, smart, he says that the unity of this concept comes from the fact that it is produced by our mind. 
our mind can produce its first concept, and the first concept we produce is the most abstract, the most universal, the most empty, and we have to start with that. So, the content, the content of the concept of being is not a determination of being. It is its unification by the act of the mind. So the paradox of this metaphysica, which introduces itself proudly as the science of being, is that its concept of being not only contains, strictly speaking, nothing, it's why it is universal, but it is the produce of the mind itself. That is what, in common language, the language is precisely not being. And we have many arguments to uh, give, to get confirmation of this paradox. So let me uh, list some of those arguments. The first is that uh, after uh, Suarez, that is in the, uh, in the modern philosophy, starting with uh, Descartes and the follower of Descartes, they kept, to some extent, the concept of metaphysics. Because there was a, <coughs> an academic tradition, people were speaking of metaphysics. But what did they understand under that name? After the position, after the, the theory uh, uh, coined and uh, I would say coined and seed for centuries by Suarez, which was so influential up to Hegel, they understood. And here I quote Descartes in a very famous text because it is a French, uh, the preface to the French translation of the Principia. Principia, uh, of, uh, principle of philosophy. I quote, the true philosophy of which the first part is metaphysics, which uh, contains the principle of knowledge. The principle of knowledge. You find the same thing in Malebranche. By metaphysics, I understand not abstract consideration about uh, imaginary <coughs> properties of science, but the general truth which can be see, used as a principle of particular sciences. In Leibniz, I acknowledge that the true metaphysics is not very different from the true logic. This is exactly Karl or Russell. Which means that from metaphysics, nothing is left, from the question of being in metaphysics, nothing is left but the principle of knowledge, which is consistent with the position of Suarez, where the basis of the metaphysica is precisely the conceptus formalis, the act of conceiving, so the first knowledge. And we have a, a, a very uh, central text about that. <clears throat> it is not only Kant who says in the uh, first critique, at the end of the first critique, metaphysics is the science of the first principle of human knowledge. Same formulation that in Meta. Fichte. Fichte, which is uh, uh, to some extent uh, the first real and bold successor of uh, Kant says, and this is in a, a, a letter to Schelling uh, from uh, 1799. According to my language, the formulation, doctrine of science, Wissenschaftslehre, 
which is the title of many of his uh, essays, does not refer at all to logic, but to transcendental philosophy, that is, to metaphysics itself. So, Wissenschaft Lehre, this very famous formulation, which will be used to some extent by uh, Hegel in the Wissenschaft der Logik. The Wissenschaft Lehre is the Fichtean German idealist word for metaphysics. And this is very consistent with uh, Suarez, I did. Nothing is left of the question of being in metaphysics but the condition of, the knowledge, of human knowledge. <coughs> and we have an additional for me, uh, upsetting <coughs> argument to support this reduction uh, of metaphysics to the principle of knowledge. This disappearing of the science the question of being within metaphysics in another neologism, neologism. There is a rule in historical philosophy, not only in historical philosophy, that when a new word comes to be used, the thing referred to by this new word starts to disappear. That is, metaphysics started to disappear when the word of metaphysics came in use. You can say uh, we have some suspicion about theology because theology was used for the first time in criticized by Bernard, by Abelard, at the end of the uh, 12th century. And uh, so you can say that the, the 12th first century of Christian theology were worked out by guys who have never used the term theology. And the inflation, inflation of theology in uh, the two last century is perhaps not a very optimistic symptom about the evolution of this science. Same thing for ontology. Ontology was never used before 17th century. It was a neologism which was first used by Calvinist uh, philosophers uh, in Saint Gallen, Lorardus, uh, 1603. And after that, Goclenius in Köln, uh, 1613. And it was imposed for the first time by uh, uh, a very uh, strong supporter of Cartesianism, Karl Berg, who in the third edition of his Ontosophia, uh, published in Amsterdam in uh, 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 1666, 64, excuse me, uh, uh, impose the word of ontologia, that is the logos, the discourse about being, which is quite surprising that uh, is a Calvinist and Cartesian <laughs> tradition, they impose the use of ontology, completely unknown for <coughs> but more surprising is the his definition of what ontology is speaking about. So it is the first page of the ontology. I submit it. Question. What do we understand under the name of being, Torah? We could say, first, uh, first possibility, we say, following uh, Aristotle, that Tito on tuto tis et usia. That is, uh, if we ask for what is being, the answer is the essence or substance, usia. I say, yes, this is the authority of Aristotle, we have to get to that. But, uh, unfortunately, uh, <laughs> many things are which are not the usia, the substance, mostly the accident. The accidents are 
for short time or long time. They are by themselves or not by themselves. They are subsistent or not subsistent, but they are. So it is a too narrow uh, definition of being. So let us shift to another definition, which is borrowed from Stoicism. That is, it is something, a liquid. T, in Greek. So anytime there is something, a liquid, there is being. Yes, it's better. But there is an objection to that. That when there is no liquid, when there is nothing, nevertheless, we can speak about it. For instance, when there is a logical inconsistency, an empirical impossibility, a nonsense, we can very well discuss the case, make a distinction, whether it is a nonsense or a contradiction, or whether it is only an empirical impossibility. <coughs> this is well known uh, since uh, Boltano, Brentano, uh, 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 the theory of the object, uh, why not? Thank you, why not? And this was discussed by Russell, so there is no question, we can discuss about non-existing things. And we have an evidence of that at the end of the first part of the first critique, Kant has a table of nothingness. So for Kant, there are four meanings of nothingness, you, could, you can discuss that. So there is no question, we can think about nothingness, so nothingness has something real in it. So, is there a name for this quasi-being of consciousness? Yes, says, uh, says uh, Calaubert. Being, at the end, is everything which can be thought. Cogitabile. Everything which can be thought. Which is completely consistent with Suarez and Edens and, and Cotus. The content of the concept of being is the first thing that can be, no, uh, can be sold. So, when Heidegger says that metaphysics lead to nihilism, he says an obvious and openly undiscutable uh, truth. Metaphysics leads the question of being to nihilism because the last possible definition of being means a cogitabile, which has no need to be in the traditional meaning of the word, to be a part of being. This look as a, a paradox. But this paradox was, I would say, obviously documented by uh, philosophy after Kant. We have to, to keep in mind the opening pages of the first part of the Wissenschaft der Logik of Hegel, uh, Logik des Seins, which says, explain that the concept of being is equal to the concept of nothingness. They have the same characteristic, that is, they have no characteristic at all. They share this in common, it's why philosophy is, can be said, metaphysics, can be said either as the science of nothingness or the science of being. And when Nietzsche says in the uh, Twilight of the idols, that being is the last uh, <coughs> perfume of a vanishing reality, he says exactly the same thing. So the very long and documented demonstration by Heidegger that metaphysics lead to the extension of the Zion's argument, to social being, that is to nihilism, is simply, from an historical point of view, obvious. So my question is, is there 
another possible meaning of metaphysics. After all, you can, and very, very often uh, this question was raised uh, in the conferences uh, which I attended, or uh, it was an objection made in my analysis. The objection was, uh, yes, this is the historical meaning of metaphysics. Uh, we may admit your argument, it led to nihilism. Nevertheless, we can perhaps make, try to make metaphysics in another way and uh, avoid this uh, final catastrophe. And uh, there are great examples of that. The first was Husserl. Husserl uh, is very uh, clear about that when he, he, he says uh, that, uh, let me see, give uh, uh, <coughs> It is at the end of the Cartesian Meditation, section 64. He says that we shall try not to uh, reject the metaphysics, but only the old style of metaphysics, and build up a new one, which will be concrete and not abstract, and so on. And uh, there are many other discussions. The objection is that, in fact, in this attempt, what was reached by the uh, middle position of Husserl in the uh, Ideal World in 1913 uh, uh, was in fact a new uh, version of the transcendental philosophy, that is the system back to Kant. You can uh, uh, use the same uh, argument with Heidegger himself. Heidegger, as I said in the beginning, started with the idea that the ontology, the classical ontology, that of Suarez and so on, led to the conceptus abstractus uh, universalis, universalissimus and empty of being, and we should have a more fundamental ontology instead. So in being and time, he made the attempt to build up a fundamental ontology. And he, in the Kant book, Kant to das Problem der Metaphysik, the conclusion of in the last paragraph is to say not only the Dasein can uh, start a new metaphysic, but the Dasein itself is metaphysics. Okay? Dasein is the transition, the meta, uh, between common being and the third being. But Heidegger himself, he has taken him. Uh, 20 years, has given up this uh, project to renew something under the name of metaphysic or ontology. Because he said that the question of being was asked from the beginning wrongly by Aristotle, and that we have to reformulate the question of being, and we cannot do that using the same words. Because if you restore metaphysic to improve it, you will be trapped, nevertheless, in the limitations of the beginning. So we have to shift out of metaphysics and even out of the question of being. Being has to vanish, as he said in the Zeit und Zeit, not Zeit und Zeit, Zeit und Zeit, the last text, in what he called Eraimis, which is commonly translated as So. Same thing with Levinas. At the beginning, Levinas was using metaphysics to uh, support the primacy of ethics <laughs> against totality and against the old concept of being in metaphysics. He started like that. And uh, at the end, he has given up any reuse, renewal of the word metaphysics. I know perfectly well 
that there are some distinguished uh, French uh, philosophers, uh, starting with uh, uh, Stanislas Breton, who, uh, in, uh, is, is, uh, was in fact in, in, in Europe that, uh, studies, uh, that uh, this tradition, uh, uh, this, those European have uh, developed this in, in, in North America. Uh, Stanislas Breton, in 1981, suggests to keep not metaphysics, but what he called the function meta, the operation meta. That is, what is metaphysics? It is the act to go beyond, which is the meaning of meta, to go beyond, trans. Not transgender, but trans as such. And this was taken over by Paul Ricoeur in uh, <coughs> 1993 in uh, the Revue Métaphysique et Morale, uh, the paper called De la Métaphysique à la Morale, and finally by Jean Grech, the former Canadian uh, lecturer, uh, in uh, 1996, La Fonction Méta dans l'espace contemporain du constat. The idea that any time there is a transgression, when you go beyond, there is a renewal of metaphysics. Well, it is too easy to be taken seriously. Uh, for two reasons. Also, uh, great consideration for Jean Grèche, for Stanislav Breton, and we are friends, and for Ricoeur, indeed. Uh, but the point is not there. You cannot use meta, which is a uh, uh, composition, without uh, the thing you cross. You cannot go beyond if you don't know beyond what. And indeed, if you don't know toward what you cross. And this indeterminacy, far from requalifying metaphysica, is a repetition of the original indeterminacy of metaphysica, of the so-called metaphysics. That is, just we are back to the beginning. That is the first thing. Second is that uh, trans as such, uh, you can say metaphysics, is the way to go beyond. The question is, is it possible to go beyond without knowing what you leave and what you may get or reach? The whole question is not whether we, we are ready to go beyond. It is to see the goal, the region beyond, of that beyond. What is the new region? What is the new continent? <clears throat> so, to this question, I have to, uh, to, to, to confess that I have a possible answer, uh, which is directly connected to the evolution of uh, phenomenology. Phenomenology, with Husserl, was first the science of the object, of the objectivity, objectivity, the objectivity science, based on the fact that we can constitute the phenomena into objects. This can be called better than objectivity, objectivity, which is the result, can be called objectivity, the fact to be constituted as an object. This is a wide and serious determination, uh, which can be expanded beyond the limits of uh, Science. This was done by Husserl. Heidegger came and showed that there are phenomena which are not objects and cannot become objects. The example, uh, anxiety is a phenomenon crucial to, for, for the design and it is not an object. Uh, the, the object, the, 
the phenomena uh, which are uh, which we can use cannot be described as object. So so the night and so on. And he is right. And uh, so he said, the final determination of the object is its end. Is an entity, is sign height, is way of being. And this is as a being that the phenomenon can be described not always as an object. Levinas came and said, well, there are some phenomena which are not neither objects nor beings. All the phenomena related to the experience of the otherness of the other man. The otherness of the other man is, to oversimplify, is ethical. Ethical phenomena are irreducible to the two first interpretation of the phenomena. There is a last possible view, which can be traced back time to time in the background, not first row, uh, uh, in Husserl, when he says that the phenomenon are given, given, that the presence is a given height, givenness, or to Heidegger, when he says that more radical than being in time is the, he gives, it has gift. And uh, in another way, in uh, Levinas, we use as well the SDP. That is, the phenomena in last determination are always given. Givenness is perhaps the last horizon. So, would we uh, try to go beyond? It would be to go beyond back. Back beyond objectivity to being and back beyond beingness to givenness. This may be a new starting moment. But uh, as you guess, this is a work in progress. I thank you for your attention. Professor Mario, uh, I think we've heard a, a masterly uh, tour uh, through the meanings of ontology, and metaphysics, and the philosophy of the concept and the gradual emptying out of the concept of being until it became the concept of nothingness, and that it became in later modern philosophy the account of the principles of knowledge instead of the account of the nature of all things. Uh, Professor Marion began by talking about the pronouncement of the end of metaphysics in both Heidegger and Carnap, and then went on to talk uh, in a manner that I recognize very well about the uh, Thomistic position on being was more diverse among the Thomists <laughs> than among <laughs> anybody else. And uh, my own professor, uh, uh, <laughs> that later Cardinal Cano, Desmond Cano, reserved most of his ire for Gisson yes. and Maritain uh, and Marichal, the, the transcendental Thomas. And uh, but he had more of the time for Garigou, Lagrange, and some of the other old realistic Thomas. But anyway, this internal fight was really just part of a larger debate about the meaning of being, uh, which continues uh, to this day. I think it was Etienne Gilson who said that uh, philosophy tends to bury its undertakers. So almost everyone who has predicted the end of philosophy and the end of metaphysics has seen a new rebirth in a different form. And so it is today that we heard uh, that uh, we have moved to the the recognition that perhaps the meta or the trans is really the uh, 
uh, the return to givenness, to the one thing that cannot be erased, uh, namely the, 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 the donation or the presence uh, of, uh, of uh, meaning and givenness in our experience. I think we have time for some questions. Uh, perhaps uh, uh, people put their hands up and stand up and I'll try and catch them. Yes, uh, uh, Father Basile, who is a Kantian, so has a big to say. This is a bad start, but thank you very much for your lecture. It wasn't boring at all, it was very exciting. So, my, uh, I had the impression that you focused your analysis of the historical understanding of metaphysics on the theoretical meaning of metaphysics. Metaphysics as uh, the thing of the object of speculation, speculative metaphysics. What about, speaking of Kant, uh, what about the attempt to develop the metaphysics as moral, for instance, or metaphysics as aesthetics, so beautiful, sublime, metaphysics as hermeneutics, even by Jaspers, the attempt to define metaphysics as transcendence. So, and then this transcendence that is not transcendence to an object, an objectivity, but to the, uh, 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 the, the, the transcending towards the source itself, the encompassing, that is something uh, undefinable uh, by itself. Would you like to come up here? Well, <coughs> indeed, uh, I am aware of uh, the attempt made by Kant to, uh, to add to the uh, speculative metaphysics uh, the metaphysics as eaten. You can do that. You can call metaphysics uh, many other fields of uh, philosophy. But uh, it is not precise. Because when metaphysics was first used, in the history of philosophy, it was about the question of being, clearly. It was a, a name uh, coined to identify the science remained anonymous in the book Gamma of, of Aristotle, uh, the science of Thoreau and in quantum Hans. And it developed <coughs> on that uh, field, question of being. So, uh, indeed, uh, there is no, no, uh, nothing is forbidden, and you can say I make, uh, I attempt to make a metaphysic of, uh, of art, a metaphysic of morals, and so on. But it, uh, it is the metaphor. What you can say, for uh, example, is the condition of, of Levinas. I say that the first philosophy is not. The question of me, it is the question of the other. That ethics is the first philosophy. This has perfect meaning. But drop the name of metaphysics, it's confusing. So you can say that hermeneutics is the first philosophy. I think it is not true. <laughs> it, cannot, it cannot be the first philosophy because it, it, it is the consequence of the analytic designs. That's another problem, but it makes sense to, to claim to do that. But uh, any uh, extended and loosey use of metaphysics is confusing. So I would I would discourage this uh, this uh, this is a neo -mogism. We have no need of neurologism, it is confusing. And there was a, a, so many. Alors, another point about uh, Thomism. <coughs> uh, what is very interesting in, in Thomism is that what I said is, uh, was said, in fact, to some extent by, by Gilson himself in uh, uh, Lettre à l'essence. How was Lettre à l'essence translated in, in, in English? Yes, yes. Uh, it is a story told uh, by, in, the, in that book. Uh, that is, uh, the classical, the metaphysical interpretation of Thomas by Neo-Thomist 
uh, led to, the, to, 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 ni to nihilism, he's very clear about that. And uh, why uh, Thomas itself has escaped this uh, disaster, it's because there is no concept to scientists in Thomas Aquinas. In Thomas Aquinas, there is the ans commune, which is not a consensus, or not in the meaning of uh, Scotus and the other, and God is not submitted to the ans commune. God is the actus essendi, completely uh, transcendent and different from uh, the ans commune. The actus essendi is not a con a submitted to a concept by definition and remains completely unknowable. So, the, 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 the Thomas is not involved in this uh, titanic uh, uh, navigation. Yep. Uh, yes, please. Hi. Um, thank you so much for your talk. I really appreciate this a lot. Uh, just a question about this, whether it is that there is a concept of being in, in Thomas. Um, in the beginning of De Veritate, De Veritate 1 1, there's this claim to say uh, that just like um, there's a first in the order of judgment, uh, the principle of contradiction, so too there's a first in the order of concepts. Um, this is called uh, the end spring of consciousness, which is to say being as first known. I'm wondering in what respect, uh, how exactly you understand this, given the claim that there's no concept of being in Thomas. Um, I know this is not stressed specifically by readers like Josson and etc., but uh, it has been stressed um, by different uh, branches of Thomas. Uh, this is true, uh, because Thomas used to say that the Ant Commune is the first things which come to the to the intellectus or to the imagination. Uh, but it is not a concept uh, insofar as there is no grasp uh, of uh, a, a special content. The ens commune is our first move uh, to have access to anything. But it is not, and it is not, so, so it is not the, the, the rule for all the things which are, uh, cannot be used for God, for instance. What is crucial is that uh, the conceptus antis, uh, Deus comprenditur in conceptu antis, according to, to, uh, to uh, and uh, God is not comprehended in the Antigone. So, uh, this, the text referred to is not without some ambiguity. But I would say this ambiguity uh, uh, struck us all the more because we can read this text back from the, the the doctrine of the concept to and peace uh, to come. That is, it is an ambiguity for a modern reader. It was not perhaps an ambiguity uh, for, uh, for Thomas and his contemporary reader because the, 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 the threat of the concept to and peace was not yet here. Uh, Richard Carney. Uh, thank you. Um, terrific talk. I'd just like to pick you up on what you said fleetingly about um, Don Scotus. Um, and it's around the idea of the university of being as conceptual, as maybe ultimately empty, as a metaphysical concept. But then there is in Scotus the idea that the university of being, which goes all the way from the divine to the human to the animal to the vegetal, can manifest itself some contrapuntal way with the hegelitas of each particular being, which has huge concept. It's singular, it's unique, it's um, irreducible, it's got actually many of the phenomenological qualities that 
letting us, Husserl and you, describe as the givenness of the gift. So that sort of paradox that the lamp can become unique in its unicity sort of redeems a notion of metaphysics that does give content and does give life and does give givenness to each particular thing. Yes, I know, I know, I know. The, uh, the, I mean, the, the whole orientation of Scotus, mostly. Uh, uh, we have a first access through the concept of conceptus scientist to everything, but none of those things is known as such uh, according to the conceptus scientist. Instead, uh, there is the exchangeas. Well, the difficulty of the exchangeas is that it remains unknown. We cannot, we have no access to the exchangeas. Uh, uh, it's why uh, the Ixietas uh, could turn in the mere position of nominalism. That's, uh, that's the point. And uh, uh, the, we'll say we have access to the Ixietas, to the uh, irreductible identity with no uh, equal example anywhere. Where are we at? In, in, in Hopkins' poetry <laughs> or others. But uh, so it is beyond the rasp of intelligibility because it is beyond uh, the usia. So it is a pure act. And uh, it is very difficult to, to say anything about an act. So uh, I know. Uh, it is, it is, there is a, another trick in, in, in Scotus, is that look, the fact that uh, at the end, uh, charity is beyond everything. But uh, do we have a speculative doctrine of love and charity uh, built enough in, in Scotus? Uh, this discussion I have, I have had many times with uh, 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 <coughs> with the I did. The a great specialist of that scotus, and we disagreed about <coughs> that from the beginning and uh, from his dissertation on. Because the, uh, the, the other question is a question to you. Uh, uh, what is the development of Exeitas after scotus? in theology. Not that much, as far as I know. Well, that's why Duns comes from Duns. Inscrutable, <laughs> 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 incomprehensible. But you're right, it was Hopkins who picked it up. But since Hopkins, I think there is yeah. a new life. I'm going to the woman at the back here. Yes. Hi, uh, thank you so much for your talk. It was spellbinding. Um, I was wondering, your uh, treatment of the the unity of being as conception emphasizes the activity of conception. Um, but I was just wondering, I know it also, the verb also has a sense to catch. Like there's a passive sense as well. Um, and whether, what you think of that ambiguity or whether there was a passive sense. In it. The term, the concept, yes. has the meaning of what well, McGriff grasping, but she's also saying catching which is more passive. So it, can you not understand the concept of being in a passive sense? Is that a rough yes. okay. story? Uh, well, it is not about the passivity of activity. Uh, it is about uh, the limitation of uh, being by the fact of its reception. You can. Take the example of Kant. Uh, to, to understand something, you have the begriff, which is the active uh, mastering, grasping, uh, and you have uh, the passivity of intuition. But the passivity of intuition is finite, and so uh, in both cases, there is a delimitation, a reduction 
of the experience to the limits of freedom. So it is a facility and, and activity is a real difference, but it is not the core of the difficulty. It is the fact that being is reducible to what we can understand. And perhaps precisely as in Shakespeare, uh, there is uh, more thing under the sky than what philosophy can grasp. Perhaps uh, in, uh, this is true, in philosophy, in, in uh, understanding, in culture, there is more things than what we can grasp. It is precisely why we have to try to grasp it. Finitude is not always unborn. The, the claim to uh, respect the finitude of knowledge is only in appearance, time to time, uh, an indication of humility, of intellectual humility. The real intellectual humility is that we have to try to make sense of phenomena which are too broader than we can imagine. James. I'm wondering if you could return to the uh, distinction that you made between infinity and finitude. Specifically, I'm wondering if, uh, uh, by your lights, moving forward with some conception of metaphysics, what, if any, role does infinity play? This is a very uh, broad question. What is uh, the exact meaning of infinity in the history of uh, philosophy and the history of metaphysics? Very good question. Uh, if you understand infinity in, uh, according to the uh, divide of the conceptus antis by scotus, Infinity is included in metaphysics. But there is another tradition of the infinite where the infinite, uh, how to say that, makes the system of metaphysics explode. Uh, uh, because it, 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 it is an, an exception. Well, the best example of that is Descartes with the idea of infinite. And with the, so there was a lot of study about the, the two possible sources of the concept of infinite by Descartes, uh, one coming from uh, uh, spiritual theology, and the other coming from uh, Scotus, precisely, and they contradict themselves. Uh, in Descartes, uh, uh, the idea of infinite is fictive. It is the only idea which cannot be produced by the thinking eye, which is imposing itself to the thinking eye. So coming from the outside, that's why it makes explode uh, any uh, closed uh, system in Descartes. And uh, uh, what is uh, very striking is that uh, this uh, paradoxical understanding of the infinite in Descartes was taken over explicitly by Levinas. Vinas explained that uh, uh, Descartes is a genius, he has seen that there are phenomena where uh, we have uh, our noesis, act of thinking, cannot reach the content of his thought, his noena. This is the ethical relation to the other. So the other is, the face of the other is our experience, not an ontological experience, but an ethical experience of the infinite. So in that case, we have the exteriority of this idea of infinity. How far uh, between Levinas and, and Descartes there are other examples of infinite? This question, at least for this evening, will remain, if you don't mind, open. <laughs> I think, <coughs> thank you, Professor Marion. And I know there is more time for questions, but perhaps it's time, we spoke a little bit about a reception, but we will have one now, uh, where we can have a, a drink and so on. Uh, I'm reminded of one thing I cannot leave without mentioning Gadamer. Gadamer records in his uh, Philosophische Lehrjahre, the Philosophical Apprenticeships, 
that Husserl was once asked uh, after a long lecture, can you give an example? And Husserl's answer was, yes, I consider an object in general. <laughs> <laughs> so we've seen where this concept has led to. And uh, uh, I think at this point, we want to thank Professor Marion. For Adjourn to the reception, which is somewhere nearby. I'm not going to get it somewhere. I'm somebody to go and find it. Report back. Three or four people.